Hello, and welcome to Mayor Brown's podcast series, Credibly Challenged. This podcast focuses on risk management issues for financial institutions of all sizes, particularly those in the banking sector. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I am a partner in Mayor Brown's financial services regulatory and enforcement practice. Joining me today is Sasha Kakabadze. Sasha is a senior vice president and regulatory control leader at Wells Fargo. On today's program, we will talk about what Sasha has seen in his time in the industry and trends he is seeing with respect to controls. Sasha, thank you for being on today's program. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start back at the beginning. How did you originally become involved in regulatory controls and risk management? It's not really the kind of thing they probably teach in college, um, so maybe a little background on that. Yeah, it's, it's somewhat of an unusual path. I was actually in advertising right out of college, but then when I went to law school, I was hired as a summer associate into what was then the legal and compliance department of J.P. Morgan. By the time I had started, legal and compliance has, has been the trend and other banks had actually split into two different departments. And so I worked for a couple of years at J.P. Morgan Chase in the commercial banking compliance department. And really, that was where I first cut my teeth in financial institutions and thinking about risk and compliance questions and matters importance to bank. A couple of years ago, I moved to Wells Fargo, where I moved into the front line, what was then an operational risk team focused on a corporate trust business that had both a U.S. and international presence. And then after spending a couple of years focused on that business, moved around within the same commercial banking organization to support other lending businesses, including um, asset-based lenders, floor plan financing, and have started to support kind of the group of businesses given my compliance background on all things regulatory and compliance questions and trying to advise on best practices, consistency of interpretation and application of the laws, rules and regs and how we meet those requirements through frontline controls. And, and would you recommend starting out where you are now or, or do you think that that background, that path you took of both um, law and some compliance is, is uh, a, a different way to do things. Obviously, I'm a little biased on my own background, so I always think that's a good place to start. But the more I get into my career, the more important I think it is to have a well-balanced team. So it depends on the makeup, I think, of the overall team and supporting the business. Um, from my perspective and experience, obviously having a legal background and experience in the compliance space helps me interpret the rules and translate and guide the business. But without having a deep lending experience, for example, I often don't have firsthand experience on the challenges of operationalization of the requirements. And so my colleagues who may have been underwriters or credit people, you know, they will bring that experience. And then collectively, we try to advise the business on both pragmatic and practical solutions to any given risk or requirement challenge. And and thinking outside of your team in, and thinking about the broader the, the broader bank teams that you work with, the, the uh, other lines of defense, the, the business units, how have those relationships um, changed over time? Um, how, how have you have managed some of them differently or, or been proactive in, in maintaining those relationships to, as you say, think about the operational needs of the business? Yeah, sure. So, of course, throughout a career, right, your experience and expectations evolve over time. So, if I think back to when I first started in a compliance function, I thought very much of my role somewhat siloed. Right. My job was to give advice and counsel on the applications of certain policy requirements or compliance obligations. Over time, and particularly as I've gained experience in the front line and working with different risk drives beyond just compliance, I, I, you think of your role as a bit more collaborative now and seeing down the road a bit on questions and solutions and trying to get in front of those problems. So, whereas once upon a time, I would have tackled a question or problem problem somewhat sequentially. You have 1 conversation at a time 1 solve 1 problem at a time. I think more and more my job is much more collaborative trying to get all of the risk stripes together in 1 conversation. So we have all of the different concerns represented. We have the challenges at the table 
uh, in the same conversations, so you really avoid a bunch of wasted time and effort and are thinking of a solution that works for both the business as well as the requirements with the right folks all in the same place. Helpful. That's helpful. Um, thank you for that for that perspective. And and to maybe go back to another point you had made a couple minutes ago of now that you've been in the industry for a few years and, and you have formed these relationships, you, you've tailored your own style for engaging with others. You probably have supervised others now in, in risk management issues. Um, what kinds of background do you look for in uh in a a front uh in a uh, i'll say a junior risk manager like a, a control manager or risk analyst what are the what are the attributes that that you see as valuable to to someone in your leadership role uh, so I, I, as i said i think it's generally making up a strong team so you've got the various strengths and weaknesses strengths represented and weaknesses covered so whether or not that's a subject matter expertise or deep legal and compliance background or deep business background you need all of those components i think to make a strong team in order to support the business and support them well but i also think that there are commonalities in any good risk manager irrespective of background number one i think it's a certain amount of inquisitiveness Right? You have to be able to ferret out problems and again, see around corners and think down the road of any pragmatic solution. Number two, I think it's a, somewhat of, I, I call it confidence. You wanna be bold. You want someone who's gonna offer solutions. You know, it's easy enough to ask questions, to identify problems, but you need someone to take the next step and propose a solution, even if it's not the perfect solution. Right? It's often easier for people to respond to an idea than to solve a problem from a blank canvas. And then I think number three, you need people that work well and work well together, that have initiative to go beyond their silos, that will work collaboratively with teams, as I indicated. As I think that's really important to save time and be efficient. Um, so that makeup of the team as a whole from both the background and team makeup perspective, as well as those inherent qualities of any given risk manager, ultimately, collectively, I think, make you a stronger team and help supporting the individual business that you're aligned to or the institution as a whole manage risk. So that's good. And 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 th thanks for mentioning the, the institution that um, I think lawyers listening will probably Think about how what we've been talking about so far today has been some of the the procedural parts of how you manage um, your teams, your business. Um, and now I'd like to turn to some of the substantive points around um, how you manage those risks, and and in particular, what are some of the risks for your line of business that that you think might be different from other lines of business that some of our listeners might be engaged in. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So the particular line of business I support at Wells Fargo is a collection of six different businesses. They obviously have commonalities, which is why they're grouped together under you know, one executive at, at the bank. But operationally, and their, the magnitude of their different risk stripes often look different. And so in my role, that's probably one of the bigger challenges is to think of consistent application of the rules, number one, to find best practices and solutions across the businesses, number two, but also to understand where there's meaningful differences. So for example, you know, because of my background, I think of compliance and legal risk a lot, but one of our businesses has a much bigger credit risk stripe that needs to be cared for and that's not exactly my background right as an asset based lender you are often a lender of last resort and so managing the credit risk and the security profile of your collateral and having operational processes in place to verify the sufficiency of your collateral to cover that those loans that is often you know very credit risk heavy space and so where i don't have that let's say strength or background and making sure that that is supported by other team members that do or working with our other risk partners in credit to ensure there are appropriate processes in place to underwrite for that kind of risk. 
but you also want to take those best practices to the other businesses, which are lending businesses, and so obviously also have credit risk. But maybe because of high volume of, of that another lending business and floor plan floor plan financing, to think about the operational processes and how to support those processes, which has been more operational in nature. So a little less credit risk and a little bit more operational risk. You know, if you have a failure, is it a failure of one loan or is it a failure of 100,000 loans? So ensuring you've got processes in place to manage the difference in credit risk versus operational risk. And again, thinking about the team that supports that risk, you, do you have testers in place to verify things are ex things are being executed the way you would expect? The controls are functioning as designed and that your your the efficacy of the controls are performing as as needed for that particular risk. And, and that's helpful. And and I know you mentioned there about the risk partners who you or the partners in risk that you work with on these types of things. And and many banks now have have moved risk into its own function. And so there are partners in in the business lines. There's partners in legal and in internal audit, et cetera. Um, I think probably for the people who are going to be listening to to this episode um, are a lot of lawyers. And so how how do you work with with in-house and external counsel as as risk partners in in your controls work? it's It's a good question, and in particularly because of my background, it's something that has evolved over time. Whereas once upon a time, I worked daily with lawyers internally and when there were difficult questions externally. But as I have moved into the front line, it's often I often now act as liaison between the groups. But I think it's incredibly important to have lawyers represented in those conversations. So they're getting the benefit of the conversation firsthand and avoiding what I think is a terrible game of telephone. Often, if if you don't invite lawyers to the conversation until too late in the game, you spend a lot of time catching up. You also may have lost the crux of the problem that you really need legal counsel on. It, you, the other kind of risk considerations, the operationalization, the, the considerations of difficulty and cost, et cetera, have started to play a much bigger role than what may have once been a very simple question. Does this apply or does it not apply? And if it applies, what specifically applies? And so having legal partners in those conversations and being purposeful about having legal partners and the right legal partners in those conversations has become more important. Uh, the more I get into my career and particularly moving away from the legal function and into the front line. So that that has evolved over time, but then also I think making sure that each support group like a legal or credit or operational risk or compliance also come to appreciate and understand the other risks that may be present. Because if the question is being asked in a silo, then you may get advice that is hypothetical in nature, not all that practical, which means you then just have to have the next conversation about, well, what do we do with this hypothetical advice that we now need to make practical? And so again, having all of those parties in the room at the outset so you're, you can address each of those questions and practical concerns at the same time, rather than having a lot, many different siloed and separate conversations, ultimately makes you more efficient at the end. And then typically you come up with a better solution by tackling the problem together. That's that's good to hear because that's often feedback I, I hear from clients is that they are are looking particularly for external counsel who remember that, that this is a a business that is being run and and the advice needs to be practical actionable that that it can be a no but 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 there needs to be a way to to move the business forward that that unless it is truly something that is prohibited by law or or impossible to do that that businesses are looking to their their legal partners their external counsel to to design compliant solutions and it may take some creativity on on the part of the lawyers but but they need to bring practical advice to the table that that they they don't have the luxury of of being a a judge who can drop an 80 page decision down um 
that you know they're they're the judge with life tenure, so it, it it can be whatever they want it to be, and everyone sort of has to accept it. That that external counsel need to to remember that business sense when we're crafting our our legal advice. And I, I would also suggest it's really helpful to have that conversation if you need to go to external counsel for everyone to be in that conversation as well. Because again, as is often the case, and, and it's understandable, right? That internal counsel wants to talk to external counsel. There's a cost question there. You're trying to be laser focused on the very specific legal question. But to your point, if at the end of the day, the question needs to be translated into an operational execution, having people hear it directly and be able to add additional incremental questions for consideration cuts down on that game of telephone. So nothing is lost in translation. Nothing important is missummarized merely because of the focus of the particular note taker. So when external counsel is in a conversation with internal counsel and business partners are also there, it, in my experience, makes for a quicker solution and also a more pragmatic solution. Talking about efficiency, um... I, I think another area of efficiency that I've come across in risk is not only with making sure you have all the right people at the table, but making sure that you um, have the right risks on the table when you're talking about them. And and I I, I, I know there are some people who are are fixated on on implementing a control for every risk that that you know you have a spreadsheet with. 600 questions on them and and one of them comes back negative and it's it's actually a pretty immaterial thing but now we're we're talking about that one thing that has come back negative and we have to design a control to to fix it and while, while I know that that your Wells Fargo is an enormous institution with with truly impressive resources there are still limited resources in, and and particularly for by at the business level you know it, it's not as if you have just the entire bank's checkbook at at your disposal that there are limited resources for different functions in the bank how do you efficiently identify and manage material risks yeah it's it's a good question and and it's Brings me to a saying that I, I use with some frequency, and that's no bank is in the risk elimination business. We're in the risk mitigation business. So it's it's having those collective conversation, but clearly each risk function or each risk stripe is focused on their particular area of coverage. If you're talking to someone in compliance, they think the compliance question at hand is the most important risk you may be tackling. Or if you're talking to someone in operational risk, the the operationalization and efficacy of that particular operational control is the most important risk and similarly with legal and credit. So it's thinking about the magnitude of those risks when you're obviously drawing from the same pool of resources. So in one business process or for one lending product or for one particular customer, the importance and the relative importance of each one of those risks and questions may shift and change. And so to your point about efficiency, it's focusing on the most likely risk or the highest residual risk or perhaps the highest cost and really being honest about where those trade-offs are and aligning resources appropriately. Because to your point, big complex businesses, 250,000 people, you've got to manage a lot of those resources and manage them well, because we want to mitigate risk and not eliminate risk and really trying to focus on what's going to have the highest risk to the business, irrespective of risk stripe and, and, and managing that time amongst the team is really where the collaboration is most important. I really like that phrase around uh, not being a risk eliminator, being a, a risk mitigator or a risk manager that I, I might have to steal that. For for some of my conversations, that I that that, that that's a new one, and and th thanks for sharing that. I think I stole it from one of my colleagues, so you're welcome to take it as well. Right. Uh, talking about though the complexity of the the ty types of things you're doing, especially given the the six verticals, you know, slight um, fairly substantial different products in them, um, and and a lot of that documentation responsibility. Of what you're doing, how you're um, mitigating the risks, what what are the controls that you're putting into place? Um, it it falls to you know people on your team, or you know you have to make sure that the business is putting in place that that documentation, maintaining their part of the framework. Um, 
how how do you strike a balance around having those substantive conversations executing on them but also ensuring that in 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 5 years when when you're now some senior executive and there's a new person sitting in your chair that they know what went on and and what they need to be doing yeah so i think there's a couple of things number 1 that's another phrase that is used often you need to trust but verify you trust people to do their job but you need to test it appropriately to ensure that it's working and then the other component is documentation. You need to ensure appropriate documentation so that if someone wins the lottery and walks out the door, the next person can pick up what they're doing and execute on, on, on that space. Documentation is also important because it, it verifies that you know what you're doing, right? That there is not a reliance on experience but that there's a reliance on an established process that's been considered and appropriately vetted. That that solves kind of both problems, right? Number one, again, is it, is it working as it should? Is it doing the thing that it's designed to do? But also 10 years from now, we know what occurred. We know any change that may have taken place and then we can track that and it's got, and you know, it has the appropriate oversight of all the risk stripes and partners and functions, but also the governance processes that are in place at every major bank to ensure that there is the appropriate senior management perspective on all of those risks and controls and processes and, and you take comfort that they're established. That, that that sounds similar to something in in law that that often when when you're talking to a a, a very experienced lawyer they'll be able to to give you a, a a fairly reasoned opinion they might even sketch it out um but then there's the second part where where well I'll ask the associate to put citations around that uh, or or uh, prove it out that that we we may be able to get um from from the person who's been doing this 35 years how it's done in the market but we we need to document it particularly with you know citations that th this morning i was updating a chart from about 7 years ago and and adding in those citations to make sure we could say well where have there been incremental changes um where where are the the things that someone might have put in it as experience but now we need to prove it out in in the documentation in in, in the legal authority um and thankfully here at Mayor Brown, it doesn't happen too much, but, you know, sometimes it'll turn out that what is that 35 years of experience about four or five years ago, it actually changed in the law and, and now it's out of date. And, and so that the advice needs to be altered. And, and that's why documenting upfront so, so that you aren't trying to reconstruct things later or say, well, what was that person thinking five years ago? That, that is really a, a good technique to be applying in, in the, 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 the trust, the the knowledge, trust the skill, but also verify it, run it down, document it. So. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really good point because I think people often think and worry about big changes, and big changes are easy to manage. A regulatory change, a major court case, it, it's easy to trace those those changes and update guidance or the operationalization of a process, etc. But what I what I think. What I spend a lot of time worrying about is the micro changes that in the aggregate will put you at a di very different spot. And so again, to the documentation and traceability question, do you have each of those micro changes down so that you understand how you got from A to Z, where when you were moving from A to B, it felt very small, but 10 other changes later, you are now at a very different spot that if you didn't track all of those micro changes, it's hard to trace how in aggregate you ended up in a very different direction than you may have. Whereas again, if it had just happened through a major change, it's pretty clear. It sounds like your, your job involves both seeing the forest and the trees, but then also seeing how they grow and change over time. Um, and and so, uh, that, 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 I mean, it's a complicated thing to do to, to see, you know, that thinning out these trees in this particular area might reduce the, the resiliency of the forest or that the other one areas might have become overgrown with brush and 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 now we need to go in there and cut some stuff back and 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 manage the forest um and and i've really belabored that analogy but i'm just going to keep running with it um what are some of the the current trends that, that you're seeing in in your part of the industry and business controls 
Yeah, so I, I love the analogy. First of all, I use the forest for the trees quite a bit and is one of my go to sayings. But I, I think to, to stick with your analogy, it's also trying to see where the forest is no longer a forest, but you're moving into a desert. So if I think about the regulatory landscape and in particular, as it relates to commercial banking, where we deal with commercial clients traditionally, and we're dealing with savvy institutions often represented by external counsel in their particular deal documents. We ha typically think of those customers as very different than your standard consumer borrower. And so the different laws, rules, and regs that apply, we treat them very differently. We have very different processes, et cetera. But one of the major trends is obviously trying to think of where consumer regulations are now starting to apply corporate customers and have the court cases changed or have the enforcement actions started to focus on the application of those what you would have considered as historically consumer regulations now being applied to a commercial business and how do how do we deal with that and in particular to one of your earlier questions about managing efficiently the risk and mitigating risk you know is there some indication that a consumer regulation may start to apply to a corporate customer what's the likelihood of that happening and do we prioritize changing processes to deal with something that may be unlikely although possible or do we you know focus on again maybe traditional operational risks that are in place because of the historic laws rules and regs so from a trend perspective at least that is something we've started to see more and more working with our legal and compliance to partners partners trying to see down the road a bit where we may have problems and need to get in front of those problems because again new rules are easy everyone typically has a process in place to deal with new rules or different rules but trying to anticipate where older rules may now apply it is much more challenging and that's where we often rely on our legal compliance and sometimes external counsel partners to give advice um, so we can prioritize appropriately and and that makes sense that's that's consistent with with again my my more limited view from from the legal side of of questions we get around around um, how to treat certain types of small business customers and and even customers who may not be that small but are our business customers and and around some of the CFPB regs that you know not as frequently on the deposit side, but on on the um, on the lending side, on some of the the payments type products or or you know the areas where payments and and lending cross each other in a in a little blurry fashion. Um, that that is an area where more businesses are starting to pay attention to it. And, and it is something that people are considering of, well, wait, why doesn't this apply to, to my small business activities? Is, is there, you know, we, we've always focused on it before in, in our retail branch bank, but, but, but what, why isn't the policy expanded to our, our, our small business or even our, our commercial banking? And, and sometimes we can say, well, here's why it doesn't make sense to apply the policy, or here's why there's a, a reasoned analysis. And, and then other times you say, well, really, it's you might already be doing it. It's all consistent with your your bank's values. It's consistent with your code of conduct. You know, like UDAP is a great example of things of a lot of people have UDAP policies, but it's also a lot of it things that are in your code of conduct that that you're not going to be misleading customers or or um, being unfair to your customers in, in in even if the policy doesn't go there that your code of conduct your institutional culture is another control that exists around it yeah i think that's a great example because that's, that's exactly right every business wants to do what's right for the most part at the end of the day based on your code of conduct based on the culture particularly at wells fargo you know everyone wants to do what is right but it's ensuring that you have the appropriate controls and processes in place that on the technical application of the rules, when there's a question or interaction with customers that your frontline folks have the appropriate guidance that they need and are writing all of the information that's needed. But UDAP's a great example because you would historically think of it as a consumer facing regulation, but even in a commercial lending perspective, ensuring that your commercial customers are being treated the same way. And, and, and 
are getting the clear disclosures that they need, the the upfront clarity that they need on any given product or structure of a transaction, et cetera. And so not just having in the code of conduct or policies or processes or controls, right, but also good advice on where those rules may be changing or different so that we are arming the business to do what they want to do anyway, which is treat customers the way they themselves will want to be treated. Sasha, this has been a really great conversation, and I want to thank you for, for taking the time to, to talk to our listeners. I think they'll appreciate um, your holistic view and, and also how you've managed to coordinate the, the complexity of all of those verticals and different products in, in your, your time at, at, at these large institutions that you've, you've not only gotten up to speed quite quickly on a, on a dizzying array of products, but you have a sophisticated grasp of, of how to design controls for them. And so thank you so much for joining us today. I also want to thank our listeners. Without you, I wouldn't have a reason to do this. Um, and, and so we appreciate you tuning in and please stay tuned to next month's edition. Thank you for having me.